And I wanted to introduce our guest of honor, Dr. Mark Boslow. Some of you know Mark Boslow, um, and some, of, some other people like myself have only heard the name. And so I thought it would be appropriate um, to, if you're not familiar with him, to, to give a, a suitable introduction. And I wanted to start off with this quote from Physics Today. He was interviewed in 2014. And Mark said, I managed to be a slacker in high school. And you know that when somebody's a slacker in high school, that they can only go one of two ways after that. They can go all the way down or they can go all the way up. <laughs> and I think that um, this is what you would expect of a slacker who goes all the way up. Uh, Mark is responsible for creating one of the top 100 April Fool's Day hoaxes of all time. And um, I'll let you look that up. Uh, he wrote an article, Alabama Changes the Value of Pi in 1998. And I think this was something like number seven on the all-time list in the Museum of Hoaxes. And you can go and you can read that article yourself. Um, it's not often that a high school slacker is sought out by Physics Today for an interview about his passion for asteroids. And um, looking through that interview, I, I found a few selected Mark Boslow quotes that I think give you a feel for what he's about. The hydro codes that were developed for modeling nuclear explosions are the same ones that I use to model asteroid air bursts. If the Earth got hit by a big comet like Jupiter did, what would happen? My asteroid work is my passion, and then an asteroid is like a directed energy weapon. I made the case that global warming is very much a national security and a global security issue. So who is Mark Boslow? has spent 34 years at Sandia National Laboratories doing research on hypervelocity impacts, energetic materials, explosions, and the global risk from asteroid impacts and climate change. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Sandia, it is one of the, the big national laboratories uh, devoted to uh, challenging security issues. And they were involved in the Manhattan Project all the way back uh, all the way back in World War II, when this was a, a very urgent problem for the United States. Um, Sandy says, we apply science to help detect, repel, defeat, or mitigate threats. And Mark has been instrumental in uh, including such threats as uh, near-Earth objects and the threat posed by global warming and climate change. Uh, Mark has written for the Skeptical Inquirer. And if you go to their website, you can find a whole bunch of articles by him. He's a vocal critic of pseudoscience and anti-science. And Mark was elected a fellow of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry in 2011, which is a great honor. Uh, Mark's done TEDx talks on global warming, and you can look that up, uh, done at Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, Mark actually has been involved in politics, running for the New Mexico State House of Representatives. And I think just about everybody's seen the NOVA documentary, Meteor Strike, and uh, Mark Boslow and Peter Brown and the whole gang are involved in that documentary. And also they all co-authored this 500 kiloton airburst over a Chelyabinsk article, which I think was a cover story in Nature, a very big article. Oh, and then this one here, I can't quite read it, but I think it says defend planet Earth, the life it supports and the science we use to understand it. So he's come a long way. <laughs> and here's Mark out in the Libyan desert. And the one quote that really struck me from that article in Physics Today was he said, I think my favorite thing is field work. And uh, what he's going to be talking a little bit about tonight is things related to the riddle of desert glass. He's worked with Discover and National Geographic um, in 2006. Um, he investigated um, air bursts and the desert. And tonight we're honored, and I'm extremely honored to introduce Dr. Mark Boslow to talk about the 100 megaton air burst that occurred in ancient Egypt. And I'll hand that over to Mark. Well, thank you for the great introduction, Dale. I think that's probably the most comprehensive introduction I've ever had, in, including the slacker part. <laughs> and, and thanks, uh, Peter, for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here. Um, 
I actually gave a presentation. Uh, there was a national convention here in Albuquerque a few weeks ago of Alcon. Um, and so I, I'm gonna, I, I, I hope nobody is gonna see that this is mostly a repeat of <laughs> that. Um, that was an hour long talk. I, I, I have a, only 45 minutes, so um, I may have to skip a few slides uh, to get it to fit. And I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna try to start and I'm gonna try to show the videos with sound. The last time I tried this, it cut off the sound so I couldn't hear you, but I, I think I might be able, I think I did something wrong. So I'm gonna try that again. If it does it, I'll back out. And so that, cause I'd rather hear you than the sound of a few videos. So let me share the screen and I'm gonna click share sound and I'm gonna put this up and now I'm going to check my speaker and it's still okay somebody say something and I don't hear anything hello okay I can hear you so I think I think I did it right that time I I didn't do anything different so I don't know what happened um and now I'm going to shrink the pictures of you all so I can see what I'm presenting and I'm going to go to presentation mode and if you have any questions, just jump in. And if I don't respond, it means, I guess it means that I lost your, your audio. Um, so, so as Dale said, I spent um, something like 34 years at Sandia Labs. And a lot of what I'm gonna talk about uh, is based on work that I did at Sandia. Um, I, I am gonna, towards the end, talk about some more recent stuff. But most of this was work that I did during my uh, Sandia career. Um, and you can, by the way, follow me on uh, Twitter. Um, and it's just my name, at Mark Boslow. Um, so I'm going to start off. It was good to see uh, David Levy, Levy, who I knew kind of from a previous life back in the 90s when uh, his comet slammed into Jupiter. Um, but I, I, th there are at least four amateur astronomers or nominally amateur astronomers um, that have made major contributions to my field. And David is one of them um, with his co-discovery of this uh, comet that slammed into Jupiter in the summer of 1995. Um, it was discovered in, in uh, I'm sorry, the 94, I'm already starting to forget. So it slammed into the, um, into Jupiter in the summer of 94, discovered in 93, and determined to be on a collision course in 93. It was actually um, something like 20 fragments. And we had enough warning, um, enough time, that we could actually apply our, uh, our hydro codes and our brand new at Sandia um, massively parallel computer, which at the time was the most powerful computer in the world. Um, and we were able to run the first 3D simulations of an asteroid in, or a comet impact um, uh, on Jupiter. And, and we did a, we made some predictions and I'll show you those later, but it turned out that they um, were, were pretty good and they were, were able to uh, actually guide some of the observations. Um, now, Tom Bach um, kind of came into this from a different direction. He was co-discoverer uh, with Alan Hale uh, of the famous comet Hale-Bopp. Um, and, and he, I, I put Jim Stevens on there too because it was actually his telescope and under his guidance that Tom was the first one to see it, but Tom was the one who got his name on it. And I, I uh, put together, organized a session at a conference called Space 96 in Albuquerque in the summer of 96. And I invited Alan Hale, Tom Bach, David Levy, and Gene Shoemaker, um, and Carolyn, although I don't think Carolyn came, um, but the four of, four of these comet discoveries were all in the same room at the same time. And one of my biggest regrets is that nobody took a picture of, uh, of the discoverers of the two most famous comets of the 1990s and maybe of the 20th century. Um, Anthony Wesley um, is an Australian observer and he has made major contrib 
contributions, having discovered uh, impacts on Jupiter. Um, the, the first one is he found a dark scar very similar to the scars of uh, the big fragments of shoemaker Levy 9 um, above the clouds of Jupiter. And that he did, didn't actually observe the impact, but observed the aftermath of the impact. And then a year later, actually saw a flash. And paper, several papers have been written about those. And so we know that the impact of shoemaker Levy 9 on Jupiter wasn't just a one-time event. There's been several impacts, observed impacts since then, first discovered by Anthony Wesley. And then finally, Bill Gray, um, who is, you know, I, I, I think the term amateur is, you know, sort of implies unpaid and also, you know, not necessarily contributions to the profession, but Bill Gray is one of those guys who has made major contributions. Uh, through his software and ability to make predictions, including um, the prediction of the uh, uh, booster um, that hit the moon and very much nailed the, the spot where it uh, collided. And this was, um, I can't remember exactly when it was, but it was a while back. Um, so also videographers uh, have made contributions and people that just happen to be holding cameras and video cameras, and I'm gonna show a video and I hope you can hear the sound. Um, can everyone hear the narration? And I'm not sure you I can hear you need a telescope to see an asteroid or meteor. Sometimes they come too close for comfort. This meteor was captured by amateur cameramen before it finally impacted in New York State. This fireball, photographed passing 10 miles above the Earth, was large enough to have leveled a city had it hit. It streaked across three states in only a few seconds before skipping back into space. And I should say something about that narration. Um, it was, there, there was actually some, a, a bit of a mistake about that. Uh, that uh, event um, in 1972, the great fireball over the Tetons in 1972. It, it, it's actually not 10 miles above the surface, but 57 kilometers above the surface. And it didn't really skip. It, uh, there, there really is no lateral uh, uh, lift on an asteroid in the atmosphere, or very little um, compared to the drag. So really all that happened was it slowed down. It was in a hyperbolic orbit. So the curvature of the orbit of, of, of that asteroid at um, perigee was less than the curvature of the Earth. So as it, as it got close to the Earth, it was you know, not curving enough to stay at the same altitude and it rose and went back into space. And I have more stories about that um, that I can talk about at the end if we have time. Now, this um, is a video uh, that was also um, collect, uh, filmed by an amateur in Russia of the Chelyabinsk. And Chelyabinsk was kind of similar to that 1972 event, except it was coming in steeply enough. It was coming in at something like a, a 18 degree angle. So it, its perigee was ended up being the surface of the earth as pieces, uh, as it exploded and pieces fell out. And you're going to hear some big booms, and you're also going to hear some Russian swear words, if you know Russian, if you can hear. So um, one of the things um, that I think most, if not all of you know, Peter Brown, he used that video, he and his students uh, used that video to construct um, a map of what the cloud looked like of the, from the Chelyabinsk uh, object. Um, and this is basically the wake 
um, and what it looked like from pretty much directly underneath. And, and it split into two kind of symmetric um, separate wakes. Um, and, and, you know, when I first saw this, I was puzzled. Um, I wondered if, you know, the asteroid itself had split into two. Um, but then uh, Peter pointed me to some literature and then I did some simulations where I, using the same code that we use for the shoemaker Levy 9 and other, um, other simulations, um, by putting just a horizontal tube in the air and, and looking at how it rose buoyantly. And what it did was it created uh, two vortices, two linear vortices, very much like um, the weight vort vortices from a plane's wings, but in the other direction. So, so an airplane creates weight vortices because it's pushing down on the air. And at the, at the tips of the uh, wings, you get this vortex where you're rotating, uh, the, the, the vortices are rotating like this, but this is the opposite. It's a buoyancy effect. And so the vortices are rotating the other direction. And this is a simulation, very simple, easy simulation that I did just to show the effect. And you can see the, the rising and spinning vortices that end up being separated by a couple of uh, kilometers. And I, I'm guessing that I cannot hear you because I haven't heard anyone talk. Can somebody say something just to be sure? Because I, I think I, go... I muted everyone, Mark. So oh, that, okay, uh... you muted everybody. Okay, so I can. I was getting a little worried that uh, that I was not going to be able to hear people if they had questions. We okay, do. so this is a this is a 3D simulation, um, and, and and Dale um, mentioned that paper by Brown et al. that I was a co-author of that was a cover story in Nature. And this is a, a movie version of that cover. Um, and it was uh, animated uh, by my friend and colleague and neighbor, Brad Carby, um, who did an excellent job um, turning si a simulation into something that looked very much like what happened. And what we did, so Peter came up with this idea of using the light curve as a proxy for energy deposition, which made it really easy for me to insert that, that energy deposition curve into the atmosphere, just inserting tubes of energy um, in a discretized way and then just letting it rip. So you can see it rising buoyantly and you can't really see it splitting in two. This is a 3D uh, simulation that wasn't as highly resolved, um, but it did split in two. And, and that's very much like what the shape of the uh, cloud from the asteroid, the weight from the asteroid really looked like. Um, one of the things, when I was invited uh, by Nova um, to go to Russia, it was a, it was a grueling trip and, and I didn't wanna go um, you know, unless I could actually do something and, and, but I didn't have enough time to do much. And again, Peter had this suggestion because we had collaborated, uh, before using this idea. And, and that is, um, to work out the trajectory by going to locations where an object was photographed or videoed coming into the atmosphere and going to the exact location at night on a clear night um, and, and lining everything up the way it was in the, in the picture that we had of the object, but with the stars in the background and knowing the precise GPS location uh, and knowing that we were lined up with the sky and know, knowing the exact time, um, we would know the azimuth and elevation angle to each star in the sky. And from that, we could, uh, get a higher precision, precision uh, uh, trajectory from that angle uh, of the entry. And then by doing that at multiple locations, we could triangulate. So this was the first, one of the first places I went to. Um, and it was, it was grueling because I did an overnight flight there. I spent the whole day with the, with the crew, with the film crew. And then the next night, I stayed up most of the night doing this, and then I spent the next day with the film crew, and then another night going out and finding locations, and then the first thing in the morning, the next morning, getting on a plane and, and coming back. So 
um, took me a while to recover from that. So there's the, the exact location. I can toggle back and forth and you can see the camera is not lined up the same direction, but you can see a few stars in there. And here's another one. This was a little trickier um, because the just below the, the burst to the lower left, um, I guess I can use my, my cursor there, that you can see this pole looking thing. Well, that turns out to be a light. And so that kind of washed out the sky, but you can see stars here. Um, this was this was a tough one. This was the final night, um, and we I stayed out all night with a cab driver who brought along all his friends because they wanted to see this, and his girlfriend. And uh, we went out onto this was a dash cam um, from from a car that was was driving along. This turned out to be a fairly major highway. We were there at about four in the morning. And I think this, well, this is the timestamp from the, from the dash cam. Um, so, so setting up my tripod, cause these had to be time exposures in the middle of a busy highway, I had to wait for a gap. Um, and that took a while. And I kept having to run out with my tripod, push the button and then a car or a truck would come, I'd have to run off and it took me several tries, but this is what I ended up with. And I can toggle and you can see that from the trees in the foreground that you know, it's pretty reasonably well lined up. You can see Cassio Cassiopeia in the upper left there. Um, so I mentioned this this event, <laughs> and so I was I was a teenager, and we were actually vacationing in the Tetons when this happened, um, and we didn't see it because we were in the car, and we were in the car going to the shore of Jackson Lake, which is exactly where this photograph was taken from. And everybody else there had seen it. So I spent a lot of time talking to people. People didn't know what it was. They described, most of them described it as a UFO. Um, I had read a book uh, by Philip Class, UFO, I think it was UFOs Identified. Um, I read it as a teenager because I was interested in UFOs and the cover of the book made it appear that it was advocating the alien explanation, which I was totally into, but I read it and it wasn't. It was basically using science to explain UFOs. And I remember one of his explanations was that it was a meteor. And I had read that fairly recently before being there. And I was convinced of this was, uh, this had to have been a meteor. And it actually was a couple of years um, because way pre-internet, it, it took a couple years before this film was discovered and brought, it ended up being broadcast on TV and I saw it on TV and it's like, wow, that's what I missed. <laughs> um, and and I, I, I should point out, um, Dale uh, pointed to my webpage, I blogged about this a couple weeks ago and, <laughs> one of, and, and one of the reasons I blogged about it was I was kind of complaining about clickbait. And, and so I created a clickbait title um, that this object uh, could be in a 25 year residence and this is the 50th, an 50th anniversary. So it could be coming back. And, and then what happened was, as you probably saw a couple of days after the 50th anniversary, um, there was a fireball over Utah and people associated it with this. Um, and I ended up get, I ended up getting interviewed by the Washington Post about it. Um, I'm very skeptical that it could have been the same thing. And then I discovered today that meteorites have already been recovered from that, which is very interesting. And the trajectory should be something that can be worked out, and that should con you know confirm but probably refute the notion that, that it was the same object. Um, here's Shoemaker Levy nine, um, twenty some odd fragments. Um, and so we were, we were able to get our management to allow us um, to use this supercomputer and we got access to the whole thing. The code, the hydro code was CTH, which was under development. Uh, it was the first parallel version. It was actually called PCTH. Um, the, the hardware was under development. And so, you know, they really stuck their necks out allowing us to do these simulations. And we got this paper out about a week before the first impact. And there was a dispute amongst various groups that were modeling this. We all saw these plumes. We, we all modeled these plumes. 
Um, but our group was the only one that said they might actually be visible from the Earth. The impact, for those that recall, was actually just barely over uh, the limb of Jupiter. The you know the horizon is seen from Earth, and it was in uh, it was actually kind of a, a gibbous uh, configuration where there was a strip of pre-dawn sky between the limb and the Terminator, and that should be on the next. So. So on the left is our simulation, and, and the scale on that is something like, uh, this is er early on, it's something like, I think, a thousand kilometers, that box. Um, and, and so the cloud tops are well below the Terminator. So, uh, so it actually had to rise way above the cloud tops, this jet, the, this, this sort of backfire effect that pushed a jet of hot debris um, up a very high velocity to rise over the limb to be seen from Earth, and it was push, pushed a shockwave ahead of it. And um, and I actually had presented this simulation at a at an AGU meeting in uh, uh, Baltimore. I think it was in May. And Heidi Hamill, who was the team lead of the uh, imaging for uh, Shoemaker Levy Nine collision, saw that and. And I, she was quite skeptical, but I convinced her that um, they should, at least for some of the fragments, be looking at the just over the limb and, I, and to see if they could uh, actually observe something. And on the right hand side is the impact of fragment G, um, which in the first image is self that that's too low to actually be lit by the sun. That is uh, thermal radiation uh, coming out of the uh, plume that's rising. And then as it rises higher, it starts to condense and you get this big sort of hemispherical cloud. And that's actually the shadow of Jupiter. So here's the Terminator. The, the horizon is what's cutting off the uh, thermal radiation here. And then the shadow of Jupiter on the, on the plume is here. And this is, so this plume is reflected sunlight. And these, these are actually, each one of these is in a different wavelength. And then this is actually a noctilucent cloud that still hasn't come around. It's high enough to be sunlit, but it's after the plume has collapsed and that's sunlight reflecting off of it. So I'm gonna say something about Libby and Desert Glass. And I actually, I can't see if you, you see that, but I brought a few pieces um, uh, to show you. And here's what, like one that looks just like one of these scrapers. It may have been a, a scraper, but but the upper left, that's what you see. You see things like this when you walk around the desert. Here's one that actually has uh, bits of meteoritic uh, debris mixed in with it. Um, the, this has been analyzed, this stuff, and it's got high uh, abundances of platinum group elements like iridium and osmium. And so it does have a meteoritic signature. Um, there's modern, uh, people use it for modern jewelry. And here's some uh, Paleolithic scrapers like the one that I think I may have found. Um, and, and what made this very newsworthy in the late 90s uh, was the discovery um, by an Italian mineralogist of this scarab. And this was in King Tut's tomb. This was a this was one of King Tut's pectorals, which he saw in the Egyptian museum and recognized it. It took him a long time to get permission, but finally he was able to uh, do some non-destructive testing, testing that he didn't even have to touch the, the piece to do by shining a laser through it to determine the index of refraction, which ma matches the glass perfectly, showing that it's pure silica glass. Um, and then, so, so, so that happened in the 90s, but another thing that happened um, in the 20th century was the uh, impact of uh, an explosion of an object um, over Northern Siberia, North Central Siberia that knocked down a bunch of trees, the Tunguska event in, in 1908. And, you know, it began to occur to us that all of these Shoemaker Levy 9, Libyan Desert Glass, and Tunguska were very similar events. Um, so, for the centennial anniversary of the Tunguska event in 2008, uh, June 30th, which has now been designated Asteroid Day, um, I got to go there um, with a film crew. And, and so, this, this is one of the first 
aerial photographs um, as part of the Florinsky 1961 expedition. And I, uh, I flew in in a helicopter and I, you know, I didn't, until I got home and looked at the pictures, I didn't really realize it, but that was almost the same place for, uh, photographed from roughly the same angle. Um, and so one of the things that uh, Kulik um, figured out that wasn't really understood, um, when he got there, he thought there should be craters. And he thought these boggy areas were craters, and, but eventually figured out that it didn't actually hit the ground. It must have exploded. Um, so there were there were several scientists that were there. It was actually a really busy day, um, being the centennial anniversary. There were um, there were politicians there, and there was a cosmonaut there. Um, but they took uh, the the documentary uh, producers took three scientists that all had different ideas. Um, I had the easiest job because I was really representing the mainstream idea, the uh, explosion of a small asteroid. Um, but my position was that it was actually smaller than people had um, had thought up to that point. Um, because of this sort of directed energy um, nature, it's people had modeled it in the past like a point source explosion, like a nuclear explosion and compared it um, to the damage from, from that type of explosion. But in reality, and I'll show you some simulations, when it came down, and it, it converted its kinetic energy um, to internal energy and shock energy and thermal energy, the momentum, it, it had a lot of mass. Nuclear explosions don't have a lot of mass, so they don't have a lot of momentum. This still had a lot of downward momentum and it kept coming down and that actually reinforced the, the shock wave and blew down a bunch of more trees than it would have otherwise. And so, I, uh, when I got back, I had taken a lot of photographs um, on this trip. And when I got back, I discovered that there is this uh, KSE, um, the, this uh, integrated amateur expedition um, that was very active in the 1950s and 60s. And uh, I realized that, you know, there were pictures of the same people in the same places. <laughs> and, and also not just people, but, but things. Um, like this is a, uh, uh, what they call a chum, a Tunguska teepee. There's one in, in 1928 um, and one in 2008. Um, and this was actually from Kulik's expedition. You know, he didn't get there for almost 20, 20 years after the explosion. And they built this, what I assume is a bear proof uh, box to keep their food. Um, that's still there. So it's, it's there in 1929. They put a pitched roof on it by 1982. Um, there's some participants in this amateur expedition. And there it is, a picture I took in 2008. Um, again, I didn't, until I got my pictures back, um, I didn't realize that some of them were taken from exactly the same places as the uh, Kulik expedition. Um, this was... <laughs> Me, I think I, I had had it late night, so the sun hardly goes down uh, in that part of Siberia near the uh, summer solstice. And so we've been out coring trees and doing stuff and, and until way past midnight the night before. And I think that's why I looked like I did. Also, um, there was a mosquito issue. The sound guy got to wear a mosquito net, but, you know, I was being interviewed on camera. They wouldn't let me. <laughs> Um, so this is my simulation of Tunguska, um, and the scale here, the, the very top of this box is about 20 kilometers up. I set, uh, uh, I, I prescribed the height of burst to be about 12 kilometers, and, and what you can see is that the jet doesn't go all the way down to the surface. Um, it explodes, um, the, the, the jet continues downwards under its own momentum, but then it turns around, it buoyantly rises. So the jet never made contact with the surface. The hot jet, which is, uh, which is basically asteroid vapor at very high temperature. This is a map view, a plan view of, of the same simulation. And you can see the expanding ring, um, but it doesn't have the same amplitude in every direction. Um, and, and there's a color bar there that shows um, you know, how many, what percentage of trees get blown down. 
And one of the one of the mistakes I think people made in the past was they compared it to one to the nuclear weapons uh, effects literature, and also they assumed flatland healthy forests. But it turns out you don't need nearly as strong a blast wave to blow down unhealthy forest, which it was, and you don't need nearly as high uh, wind speed or the equivalent over flat ground to blow down trees on ridges because the wind gets amplified at ridge tops. So, so you have taking that into account means that you can blow down a large area of trees or trees, I should say, that span a large area because there were pockets that weren't blown down with a much smaller explosion. And, and this is when I take all those time steps and combine them, um, I get the map to the right and then I can compare it to the observation, the map based on field work on the left. And, and it's roughly the same size, but more importantly, um, the map on the right, the computed map, you see like there's uh, in the middle, there's something that looks kind of like the eye of a hurricane. This is the horizontal component of wind. Um, I don't plot the vertical component. That's where the shock wave came directly down from above. Um, there was no horizontal component, so trees didn't get blown over sideways, but they did get their branches stripped off. The, the Russian early uh, people who got there, uh, Kulik and others, referred to these as telegraph poles. They're actually still there. Um, this is another more recent version of this where I explored the dependence of that butterfly pattern on angle. I concluded um, that it came in, the, the best estimate of the angle based on the simulations was about 35 degrees. Uh, people who, who uh, looked at the eyewitness account suggest it's probably closer to 25 degrees, which actually isn't that much different. Um, so there again is that map of, of observed tree fall. Um, when I was there, we did do cor coring, some tree coring. Um, I, followed uh, Ginter Kletechka around. But <laughs> one of the things we found were um, some, some burn scars in the pieces of wood that were in the wood pile, suggesting that those were, the, those bowls of wood for firewood had been cut down from trees that survived uh, the Tunguska explosion a hundred years, exactly a hundred years before this picture was taken. Um, so the, there was a lot of interest in Russia about this and, and, and the uh, uh, one place there was a lot of interest was within the Russian space program. And um, at least one cosmonaut um, was recruited to be a cosmonaut because he had done some uh, research uh, at Tunguska and he was particularly interested in uh, these burn scars on the trees, and that was Georgi Gretschko. Um, and there he is on the, on the left panel, um, I think in the late 50s uh, doing research. Um, in the middle panel, he's um, being a cosmonaut, dressed in his cosmonaut suit. Um, and below him, you can see the, the burn scar and where it's been healed. And, and there's still a lot of standing trees where you can see that sort of heart shape uh, outline where it's been scarred and on the right hand side he's there with some uh he's the one on the right um with some uh politicians russian politicians that were uh, posing with a monument um that was placed um at the close to the epicenter at kulik's camp um for the centennial celebration of tunguska and the monument looks strangely like a ufo to me <laughs> So one of the questions going back to this, uh, this Libyan desert glass is how can an impact make a glass? A lot of people suspected the Libyan desert glass was formed by an impact and maybe the crater had disappeared or something. Um, a, lot of, a lot of speculation and you can make uh, glass with an impact. We all know about tech types. You can see some of these beautiful moldavites, backlit moldavites here. Um, but there's also um, glass that's formed in the sway bite. And Gene Shoemaker was uh, somebody who figured all this out when he first visited Nordlingen in the 
center of Reese Crater and visited this uh, St. George's Church, he immediately saw in the sway by what looked like shot material and shot glass. And he in, ended up taking some back to the lab and showing that it had high pressure phases, which proved that the Reese Crater was formed by an impact. Um, so this is a meteor crater. It has glass um, and it, it was a, it turned sandstone into glass and, and there's certain puffed up pieces of glass, but it bears absolutely no resemblance resemblance to uh, Libyan desert glass. Um, this is Gene Shoemaker's mechanism um, for the formation of meteor crater. And you can see, you know, there's a strong shock wave that propagates downward, very high temperatures and pressures. Shock front keeps going down and there's ejecta, but some of it falls back uh, to form a lens of uh, breccia mixed with uh, with, with target material that got extremely hot and quenched to form glass. Um, and here's another, here, here's just another figure that shows a very similar thing, melt and, and breccia with the melt mixed in, which forms glass. Looks nothing like the Libyan desert glass. Um, so, so I started thinking, you know, about the fallback of uh, the plume from Shoemaker Levy 9, um, and how it heated up the atmosphere when it fell back. It was an enormous collapse. Um, so this compression of the high altitude atmosphere heat, heated up the atmosphere. And I tried to come up with a mechanism by which that heating could generate enough thermal radiation to melt surface materials. And I was unable to get it to work. And I abandoned that idea. I presented that at a conference in Bologna in 96, just before uh, the Italian, one of the Italians who was at that conference identified that piece of, uh, of um, Libyan desert glass in the Egyptian museum in the King Tut collection. And this, this made lots of news, this discovery. And he had also edited the volume um, of papers that came out of that conference. Um, I never wrote mine up, but he went ahead and put my abstract into it. And what happened was uh, the, the, because of that abstract and because there was a lot of news coverage, uh, reporters got their hands on that volume, saw my abstract that I had an explanation that I had since abandoned. Um, and I started getting calls. Um, and one of the calls I got was based on this New Scientist article. Um, and it was, uh, it was a call from a documentary maker um, that took, it, it was something like uh, seven or eight years then before she was able to get uh, funding for her production company to do this documentary. Um, but I ended up getting invited to go along the, uh, on the documentary and I was under a lot of pressure because I'd abandoned my idea. I didn't believe it anymore. And so I had to come up with a new story. Um, so this is, this is the beginning of our, uh, uh, where, when we met in Cairo at the Egyptian Museum to begin the documentary filming. And this has been Jim Sode McCauley, who's the uh, mineralogist, Italian mineralogist who discovered that uh, little uh, scarab that was made out of Libyan desert glass. Um, here we are at our, our base camp before we go tearing through the desert um, in the exciting, uh, excitingly filmed scenes that are in that documentary, which you can find on YouTube. Um, and here we are going through the uh, white desert. Um, this is our first camp, which where we had a beautiful sunset that I use in, in presentations as my background all the time now. Um, there was one vehicle that became kind of a character in that documentary. They loved the look of this old Toyota, um, but it kept getting stuck because it had the narrowest tires and driving across sand is kind of like driving across snow when it's not real crusty, it doesn't hold you up. That was the one that always broke through and they had a special way of getting it out and back on top of the sand. Um, like the Tunguska documentary, there were three scientists with three different ideas. Um, and, and my idea was still airburst, but I wasn't exactly clear on how that worked. 
I did have an epiphany um, when we were out there in the desert. Um, it dawned on me that this stuff, and I did bring a bunch of ge geology papers to read about it. It finally dawned on me. The reason I, I had come up with this idea of a collapsed plume over an enormous area was that there was an enormous area of this glass. It was spread over, uh, I think, 8,000 square kilometers is what I remember. Well, it turns out that it's 29 million years old and the climate has changed a lot uh, back and forth during that time. There were river flowing rivers uh, over this area. And what I learned when I was reading these papers at night out in the desert was that this wasn't sand in those days. It was basically the surface of Nubian sandstone, um, what the sand came from and that it had eroded uh, something like a kilometer downward in the last 30, 29, 30 million years. So therefore, if there was a crater, the crater would be gone. And if there was glass formed over a very narrow, small area, it would be could easily be transported laterally. And it's pure silica glass, silica glass which means it doesn't weather chemically. It doesn't erode. It, 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 it erodes mechanically from wind-blown sand hitting it and this stuff is i mean if you look at it carefully you see that it's sculpted and sandblasted and so uh, there's a piece there's a good example um so it's been sitting there for a really long time and it's moved um so there's a little composite uh image that i gave showing where it is right along the libyan border um so so I had already kind of figured this out, that there's a big difference between an explosion and an impact, uh, as I pointed out. And when I say explosion, I mean like a nuclear explosion, where if you set off, um, you know, five megatons, five kilometers up, if you set off a little point source, which is very little mass, you know, nuclear, the thing about nuclear uh, explosive devices is they have a very high energy density without a lot of mass. So the temperature gets super high, but there's no momentum. There are very little momentum by comparison. So if you look at what happens, you get this big spherical ball, very high temperature ball that pushes a shockwave, spherical shockwave ahead of it. And that ball rises. It's, it looks just like the wake, only this is a sphere instead of a tube, but it's kind of like the wake that I modeled um, for the Chelyabinsk explosion, but this instead of two two parallel um, vortices, it's a it's a toroidal vortex. It's like a smoke ring rising. But if you preserve the momentum, so this is this is an impact. Um, it's pointed downward, and it blows up. It just keeps going downward, and the jet in this case hits the surface. Um, so you can imagine what would happen. Uh, this is 3,000 3, degrees, uh, the temperature uh, of the highest temperatures shown here are 3,000 degrees in contact with the surface. So if there is silicate material, um, quartz, that's going to melt. And then it rises and it cools off very quickly and quenches to form glass. So this is my full simulation of uh, what I think, and this is what I did for that documentary. Um, this is kind of a sequence, similar sequence, only in this case, it actually, um, solid piece also hits the ground and creates a crater, um, kind of like around the same size as Meteor Crater, but Meteor Crater is only about 50,000 years old. This is something like 30 million years old. So this has been erased by erosion during that time. And here's my simulation of that. Um, so you can see the crater forming, but you can also see, you know, that it lasts about 20, 25 seconds and you have all this really high temperature um, vaporized asteroid in contact with the surface. And, and so it's heating the surface, but it's also blowing across the surface. Uh, let's see, I guess I don't have my, my uh, velocity map on there, but it's actually moving at supersonic velocities. So I'm going to show a clip from the documentary, and I hope you can hear the uh, narrator describe this. Thirty million years ago, 
an asteroid was on a collision course with Earth, heading for Egypt. As it began to burn up, it created a hot plume in its wake. Before reaching the ground, it exploded into a blistering fireball. Surface temperatures immediately reached 1,800 degrees Celsius. The ground, which was mostly sandstone, melted and was transformed into yellow-green glass. Above the surface, a column of superheated gas propelled itself into space. The total effect was far more devastating than if it had simply hit the ground. So, so there's two very distinct types of airbursts. There's one that I call fire in the sky, the Tunguska-like, where it doesn't make contact with the surface. So all the thermal effects are like the burn marks on the trees that that cosmonaut um, Gretzko uh, studied. And the other kind, the jet comes all the way to the surface. It's so hot and it's in direct contact. So any organic material like trees would be completely incinerated, incinerated and vaporized. And even, um, you know, solid rock would be turned to glass uh, if exposed. So, so when I got back from that documentary and thought about it and wrote it up, I suggested, you know, there, there should be, this should be very common because there's a power law distribution of asteroids. The smallest ones are the ones that blow up in the atmosphere and there's a lot more of those. So there should be more glass fields on earth than there are craters. Um, and, and a lot of people have claimed to find them, but it's, it's really hard to demonstrate. There's, it's really not convincing in most cases. In, in a lot of cases, they may be uh, impact glass or airburst glass, um, but there was a really good example, um, still not confirmed, and we actually don't really know how to confirm them. Um, but in the Atacama Desert, my colleagues, Pete Schult and Scott Harris and their co-authors, um, identified some glass in the Atacama Desert as a potential uh, impact glass. The problem is it's distributed over a really large area, even larger than the Libyan desert glass, um, which is hard to explain because this one is only uh, something like 12,000 years old. Not enough time to spread laterally. And it actually appears to have uh, been, still be in, in the place where it formed. Um, so the, <laughs> this, is, this is a little busy and hard to explain with the limited time that I have left, but the, the top row shows, uh, a simulation of one of those type two fire on the ground air bursts. The, the middle shows my explanation and it's a map view of the various glass sites the, that I modeled. There were six separate glass sites separated by something like 80 kilometers. And then I had, then it's a side view of a cascading fragmentation uh, uh, scenario that I came up with. So every dot it, it splits in two. So you end up couple of them don't split and you end up with six at the bottom. Each one of those separately is a type two airburst. And so here is my animation of that. That's, that's the, um, just the one that comes in at a fairly steep angle. And this is the animation of the cascading fragmentation. Um, so it's already fragmented and here are the separate pieces all hitting the surface and making contact and forming widely separated glass fields. Um, so we still don't know, and it may be that those have nothing to do with airburst glass, uh, but there is a possible scenario to explain the distribution. And so I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, Mark, I, I'm not sure if Dale is going to chime in. Thank you very much. Um, Chris Bolte has a question right off the bat here. Let me just see. If I, okay, there it is. Hang on. Okay. Um, I uh, Before I set everybody back to unmute, let me just read Chris's question. So historical studies of glass fields are based on tribal knowledge and shared stories over the years. 
has there been ways that technology can help this study by locating glass fields remotely via satellite or other means? That's a good question. And I'm, I'm not a remote sensing expert. Um, I know people have, have I've, I, I get email occasionally from people who are convinced that they found an airburst glass field. But when I look at what they show me, it doesn't appear to be. And even though I said that I love doing field work, I'm not a trained field geologist. I like going into the field with people who are trained. Um, I got to go to Meteor Crater with Gene Shoemaker and Sue Kiefer. And, you know, I do get the, I do get to be out in the field with geologists, but personally, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you <laughs> if I saw something, what it, what it really was. Um, but I, I, I do expect more of these to be discovered. Um, the, the real problem, in fact, I have, I didn't show it to you and I don't know, you know, I've been holding these up and I don't know if you can really see them. This is a piece of that, uh, that peak of glass. If I found, it's got a hole drilled in it because he did paleo mag. If I found something like this, I would have no idea what it was. You know, it would, might look out, look out of place, um, but, you know, it would look maybe like some human debris. I don't know. Um, so, you know, I think, I think it's important that trained geologists recognize that this is a real process. And when they do find enigmatic, unexplained places where there are glasses, that, you know, they should, they should write it up or they should draw it to the attention of, of me or others who, who are interested in this process. But you're not actually suggesting that um, it's possible all geological glass is, comes from airbursts and impacts. In the not at all. In fact, I mean, we know, you know, there's, there's uh, obsidian that comes, you know, and we call them Apache tears here. Um, little bits that come from basaltic volcanic eruptions. Um, there's there's lots of glass associated with volcanic eruptions. Um, right. So that's a different process. That's a, a completely different process. Okay. But but you know the one of the things about this silica glass, it's not volcanic. Volcanoes, you know, there's no silica, pure silica volcanoes. Um, so it's a different different composition. And, and so, you know, when there's an airburst over some alluvium that may be derived from complex minerals, you know, the glass that comes from that may be indistinguishable from a volcanic glass. And therefore, you know, context becomes very important. It's like, was there ever a volcano, you know, in recent times that, that could have made this, even though it may be derived from something that was ultimately volcanic, but ended up becoming components of the sedimentary rocks, there may be geological context. So you really have to understand geology, I think, to recognize where glass exists but doesn't belong. Um, and, and that's kind of outside my area of expertise. Does the uh, color and the sort of translucent appearance of the examples that you've shown of the Libyan desert glass is that an indicator that it came from this process? Does or does volcanic glass look basically the same? Well, there's. I don't think there's any volcanic glass that looks like this stuff. Um, you know, it's it's just got a different composition and it's it's very different. And one of the things about you know volcanic glasses is they do weather. I mean, they turn to clay, um, so they don't. You know, if they're in a humid environment, they disappear. They they turn into something else so they there's a chemical weathering but this stuff is like pyrex or you know it's it's like a it's 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 just something that lasts forever because it it's immune to chemical weathering and that's not true for volcanic glasses and it's probably not true for most airburst glasses because they're going to be formed out of whatever whatever was on the surface that that jet of hot stuff that hot um, asteroid vapor interacted with. So there may have been glass there for a while, but with all the rain and the, you know, other, other types of uh, interaction, you know, with wet 
other wet stuff and organic material, it just they, it disappears. And the other interesting thing is these things in the desert, they just become, because of all that, they become vantifacts. Like they're basically yeah. just sandblasted. And so they yeah. represent the, you know, the prevailing wind. That's right. But then the little bits, you know, they blow around. So, um, you know, they change orientation. I mean, think about it, like 29 million years. <laughs> it's just it's incomprehensible, those time scales. And they've been sitting there being sandblasted. I mean, there's a lot of them that, you know, they've been buried and re-excavated and there are these dunes, you know, in the Great Sand Sea. Under those dunes, there's a lot of glass. And, you know, it's it's gotten picked over. It's it's really gotten picked over by collectors and and the outfitters we went with took to burying, you know, when they found good pieces, they'd they dig a hole in the sand, they bury it, they GPS the location so they can bring their you know tourists back there and dig it up and look at it and not let anybody take any and, and put it back but because this the dunes are moving across the desert there's always new stuff that's appearing um that's been buried under the dunes for who knows how long <laughs> very interesting norm has a question i think he's going to unmute himself and ask i should be unmuted um the question is, what's the frequency of these events? Like once in a hundred thousand years, or once in a million years, or more frequently. And second of all, uh, are these events increasing or decreasing in the in, in on Earth? And is there a risk today, you know, in impacting humans? But yeah, those those are all good questions. So the first question was, what is the frequency? And so the frequency depends on the site, you know the sort of size distribution of objects, which is a power law. So there's many more small things than there are big things. So Tunguska sized objects, which don't have this, this blowtorch effect, a Tunguska sized object, if it's this, how big I think it is, which is 40 to 50 meters in diameter, those hit maybe once every 500 years, once every thousand years uh, in that range. We don't know exactly. Chelyabinsk events, which was a 20 meter object, we think once every 50 years, probably. Um, but the big ones, like the uh, the one that formed uh, the that I that in my scenario explains the peak of glass, that might happen every couple thousand years. Um, one that's big enough to actually hit the ground and form glass, maybe once every maybe once every thousand, maybe once every 2000 years. So, so it's not surprising to find one that's 12,000 years old. Um, it's, it, it's completely consistent with expectations that there should be one. I mean, it was, if it is one, it's lucky that it hit in a place where it was preserved. Um, but there should be others, you know, older ones that have also hit in places where it, where it would be preserved. And of course, the, the the Libyan desert glass is a case, but that was 29 million years ago, according to the fission track uh, dating. What was that method that they have for dating the the, the tens of millions of years? It, it, it's called fission track dating, and I'm not an expert on that, so I'd probably get it wrong if I tried to explain it. Are there different methods that can be used for younger examples like Meteor Crater or the Pika example? Yeah, I mean, so there's there, there's all sorts of dating methods, radioisotopes, and you know, there's paleomagnetic methods. Um, and and so there's a lot of ways and, and different methods apply to, to different scenarios. How long ago did you say the Pika? That's that. That's Pika is about twelve thousand years. So that's fairly recent by these uh, very recent in this yeah. family of events, and and it looked to me like you had analyzed it in such a way that indicated it might have broken up before it got down to the lower atmosphere. So yeah, and that was events. That was the only scenario I could come up with that reasonably could explain the the long distribution because there are these six sites that have been identified. There may be more, um, but there are six sites that are well separated from one another, but appear to be, have not been transported. 
So they're in place where they formed. There's there's reasons that the the geologists who found them think that that's true. And so how do you get such a separation with one event? Because one event would form it fairly locally. The, 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 the hot jet doesn't spread out that far. Um, and so it was the only scenario I could come up with to come in at a very shallow angle. So when they break up at high altitude, they have time to separate, but they separate along a line. And these are all kind of lined up along a straight line, north, south. And so, so, so what I did, I, you know, I didn't show that it was formed this way, but I showed that there is a mechanism by which it could have been formed with, with, a, with an airburst. Are any of the um, are any of those um, surface um, events identified with identifiable as craters now, or are they just no? Buried? There's no yeah. So if if there's no solid chunks or no significant mass behind the solid chunks that hit the ground, there's no crater. If it completely vaporizes, and that's what apparently happened at Tunguska. There's no crater. There's no evidence that anything hit the ground at Tunguska. There's not even any uh, Tunguska meteorites that anybody's ever found. And so, so it completely vaporized. It's completely gone. There's nothing left but, you know, the meteoritic debris, the hot de cloud of meteoritic debris that rose, that condensed little spherules rain out from an event like that. And those should be, you know, those get blown, blown all over the place. Uh, but there's nothing at the site that indicates that a solid piece hit the ground at high speed that would be required to make a crater. So if that happened at Tunguska, it's likely to have happened at other airburst sites that are the type to contact airbursts. Yeah. So the, in, in comparing Tunguska with the Chelyabinsk event, the Chelyabinsk impactor, the incoming uh, object was a smaller object than the... Yeah. Tunguska, but we were able to recover pieces that landed yeah. on the ground. Yeah, and not every event is the same. Um, you know, they come in at different speeds. They come. They they have different strengths. Uh, they come in at different angles. Um, and, and and so Chelyabinsk happened to be. You know, it most of it was vaporized. I mean, what what has been found is a very, very tiny fraction of the initial pre-atmospheric mass. So a very small fraction of it uh, survived. And in some cases, none survive or none survive that are found. And, and even the piece, the biggest piece of Chelyabin is the one that made a hole in the ice in that lake. Yep. You know, that was still only, I think, a few tons, which is tiny, tiny, tiny fraction. And it was, you know, it was going fast for, a big boulder, but it wasn't going fast at all compared to the initial velocity of the asteroid. Not fast enough to make a crater. Right. It can make a hole in ice, but not a crater. Okay. Are there any other are there any other questions? I'm going to ask one then. Um, you mentioned Anthony Wesley at the beginning. Yeah. And the Jupiter impacts, and I know Mark uh, Delcroix has been involved in this soft creating this software detect software to to look through the videos that amateurs make uh -huh. when they're creating these images and look for flashes I, I wondered if you knew anything about that or how successful that project has been yeah i'm i'm vaguely aware of it but i haven't i don't know any details hmm. but i'm glad they're doing it i think it's great i mean this is this is how we get the you know this is there's a lot of really good science that can come out of that and one one is what is the flux of impacts of various sizes? What is the size distribution curve? I mean, that fills in that fills in a gap um, with really good, you know, statistical, statistically significant numbers. Yeah, so, Jupiter's a nice big planet. So yeah, I mean, you've got some really interesting numbers would come out of that. And so many people are just running video for minutes on end every night. Right. You might as well yeah. utilize that yeah. data that you normally would delete. And we have, I mean, now we have every, everything's so much, you know, higher resolution, you know, CCDs and computing and storage and everything makes it, I mean, technology has finally enabled that kind of really big data collection and storage that we didn't used to be able to do. So why not exploit it? 
why not take advantage of that technology? Yeah, that's huge. Not to have to throw it away. Yeah. I was struck by your Toyota stuck in the sand. It made me think of, I don't know if you've heard of Ralph Bagnold. You did the, the book, The Physics of Blowing Sand and Desert Dunes. Oh. No, I'm he'd, not he'd been in World War II, and so he'd sort of been involved in traveling in the desert and getting vehicles unstuck, and he became fascinated by the physics of all this. Oh. And then he, that's the seminal book on desert, uh, desert geology, geomorphology, Ralph Bagnold. Ralph Bagnold. Yeah. You know, it, it, it was interesting because the drivers, you know, I mean, it's, you know, if you ski, you can like, you can recognize you know, conditions, right? And what, what, what is it, where's a good place to turn and where's a good place not to go? And the drivers figure that out just by the texture and the, you know, the layering of the sand. I mean, they can tell where it's good to drive and where it's not. And, and the reason that the old Toyota kept breaking through was because it just, because the, the weight and the, you know, the, the size of the tires and stuff like that, it was different. And so, they needed bigger tires on that thing, I think. And sometimes the <laughs> trick is to deflate the tires to make yeah. them bigger and softer so that they exactly. roll. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But these guys, these guys were experienced because they were outfitters and they went out there all the time. And I think there there was a lead, a lead vehicle that, you know, would, you know, sometimes they'd take a big sweeping turn to avoid something that didn't just didn't look like hard top sand. <laughs> So are you involved in any um, projects like this right now? I mean, you've told us about some of your past research. Is there yeah. anything kind of you have on the boil right now where there's been a recent question or uh, modeling problem? Yeah, um, so there's a few. One of them is the peak of glass that I showed. That's, that's recent work. Um, in fact, we've got a paper that we we're still working on, but it's imminently going to be submitted. Um, and then one of the things that is new also was the Hunga Tonga volcanic eruption, which created tsunami around the world, which surprised everybody. And, and we are modeling that. It's not an impact, but it's very similar to a very large air burst or impact in that it creates a, a strong shock wave that goes around the entire planet and can generate tsunami. So it's a different tsunami uh, mechanism. And so we're, so I'm actually, as we speak, I've got a simulation that's running um, of a large asteroid, but I'm more interested now in the shockwave as it propagates far field and how, that, how does that couple to tsunami formation. And that's for, the reason we're interested in that is actually the risk assessment for planetary defense. What is, what is the actual, risk associated with asteroid impact and can we quantify that and that's an interesting problem too because i mean it goes back to norm's question i mean 25 years ago people didn't it was hard to convince people to take planetary defense seriously yeah like in the 1990s there were people who poo-pooed the whole thing oh there were and and it really was shoemaker lady nine that changed the, the, the that was a big game changer and then the next one was Chelyabinsk. So, so uh, Shoemaker Levy Nine convinced a lot of people. Um, people really started taking it seriously, and the early, you know people were talking about it in the early '90s. And there was a meeting at Los Alamos prior to Shoemaker Levy Nine, where it's Teller and Sagan famously faced off with one another. You know, because Teller was a big proponent of using nuclear explosives to deflect or disrupt an asteroid and Sagan said no that's more dangerous and you know but that was you know it was it was a side the whole thing was a sideshow before Shoemaker Levy 9 and it became mainstream after that which helped appropriate money for Space Watch and all these other things yeah exactly because then, then, then the, people were willing to write some checks to actually yeah. survey what's yeah. out there yeah and then Chelyabinsk you know was another step function in the level of interest and the level of funding and 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 the level of taking it seriously <laughs> fascinating stuff are there any more questions from anybody who's been watching tonight 
So if there are no more questions, I, I would like to just take this opportunity, Mark, to thank you so much for delivering this talk to us and telling us all about this, because yeah. these are just fascinating, large scale problems. Norm, did you have something? No, 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 I just appreciate an awesome talk. Yeah, no, so thank you again on behalf of everybody here. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, I really appreciate yeah. the, the opportunity and it was fun to talk to everybody and uh, 